and thanks for spending your Friday morning with us. Um, I'm Del Harrow again. I'm a professor here at Colorado State University in the pottery area. Um, I want to introduce my colleague, Dr. David Reed, professor of art history. Um, and this symposium is part of this larger project that Dave and I have been working on for a few years now, collaborating with um, our colleague, um, Professor of Pottery, Sana Mamami, and also Lynn Bolin, the director of, director of the Gregory Alatar Museum. And um, this bigger project, it includes these two concurrent exhibitions, which are up at the Gregory Alatar Museum now on the CSU campus, um, the Shattering Perspectives, selection from the ceramics collection and the Richard DeVore and the teaching collection exhibition. And then this virtual symposium over the next couple of days. Um, and I just wanna say personally, I just wanted to say thank you to Dave who really initiated and conceived of this larger project. Um, it's really exciting to see this all coming together uh, and, and to see that, you know, an ambitious project like this can come together even in this strange time that we're living in right now. Um, so a little bit about the next couple of days, our symposium will run today and tomorrow from 10 a.m. till noon um, on both days. And today's program, we're going to begin with our uh, keynote lecture. Um, we're uh, incredibly excited and honored to have Magdalena Dundo speaking with us this morning. Um, Magdalene's lecture will be followed by an hour of questions that were submitted before the talk from students in sculpture, metals, fibers, and pottery areas of Colorado State. Um, and then tomorrow's program will be a two-hour panel discussion and that'll be um, moderated by Dr. Reap and myself. And for that panel discussion, we'll have Magdalene um, in conversation with the gallerist and ethnographer, um, Douglas Dawson, and also CSU's own uh, professor of soil science, Dr. Sue Ellen Melzer. And um, I think this uh, conversation promises to be a really compelling conversation um, where we're thinking about bringing together perspectives from both art and science to talk about clay. And, um, but then through, through this conversation, I think these larger questions of really how we engage with objects, um, works of art, our physical and material world. And um, I think this feels, you know, they're really important conversations right now, which we believe connect with issues, not only of aesthetics, but also um, ethical questions related to ideas of reciprocity, um, appropriation, and, and ecology. Um, so we really hope you'll join us for tomorrow's program as well. Uh, the second half of that program will be open to questions from the larger audience. So if you uh, have questions, if questions come up during the talk today, um, please hold on to those for, for tomorrow. And we're excited for that opportunity to engage with the entire audience at that time. Um, so I have a brief uh, pre-recorded message that our museum director, Lynn Boland, asked us to play for you with some thank yous from the museum. So I'm gonna share my screen. <coughs> and let me check really quickly. <laughs> Dave, if you could just let me know if you can hear this when I start playing it. I'm Lynn Bowling, director and chief of the Gregory Alicar Museum of Art at Colorado State University. I'll and rewind I'll... that really quickly. Here we go. Hi, I'm Lynn Bowling, director and chief curator of the Gregory Alicar Museum of Art at Colorado State University. And I've got some oral surgery coming up, so I'm coming to you by video, but it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to this online symposium held in conjunction with two current exhibitions at the museum. Shattering Perspectives, a teaching collection of African ceramics, was curated by CSU students under the direction of Dr. David Reap, CSU Associate Professor of Art History and Associate Curator of African Art at the Museum. Richard DeVore and the Teaching Collection was curated by CSU Associate Professors Sanaminami and Del Haro, and further expands on the significance of the University Museum and the pedagogical value of its collection. I offer my profound thanks and congratulations 
to the faculty curators for these engaging exhibitions and for conceiving and organizing this important program. These exhibitions were made possible by generous support from the Fund Endowment at CSU and by Colorado Creative Industries. CCI and its activities are made possible through an annual appropriation from the Colorado General Assembly and federal funds from the National Endowment <laughs> for the Arts. We're also dearly grateful to the panelists for this symposium for bringing their expertise to bear in a multidisciplinary discussion around these exhibitions. And to our keynote speaker, the internationally renowned ceramicist Magdalene Odundi, to whom I offer our most profound thanks and admiration. This talk is co-sponsored by the museum as part of our Critic and Artist Residency Series. Founded in 1997, PARS brings prominent artists, critics, and curators to the Colorado State University campus, now virtually, for public lectures, open forums, classroom visits, and student critiques. Dame Magdalene's talk is also co-sponsored by the Department of Art and Art History as part of the Scott Artist Lecture Series. We are dearly grateful to the department and to all of the individuals who make these series possible. And again, thank you all for being a part of this program. All right, thank you, Lynn. Um, <clears throat> so it's my really distinct honor to introduce um, Dame Magdalene Adundo this morning. Um, Adundo is best known for hand-built ceramics um, made with a traditional coiling technique and without the use of a potter's wheel. Um, her pieces are left unglazed and are burnished by hand. Um, Adundo was awarded the African Art Recognition Award by the Detroit Institute of Arts in 2008 and the African Heritage Outstanding Achievement in the Arts Award in 2012, together with honorary doctorates from the University of Florida and the University of Arts in London. She was appointed Officer of the Order of the British Empire for Services in the Art in 2008 and Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire in the 2020 New Year's Honors Services for Arts and Arts Education. Um, her work is included in the permanent collections of nearly 50 international exhibitions or uh, international museums, sorry, including the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, the British Museum, uh, the, London, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Cooper Hewitt Museum, uh, the National Design Museum in New York, National Museum of African Art in Washington, DC, and, and many, many others. Um, and I just wanted to say, you know, on a, on a personal note, on a more personal note, um, I first encountered Adendo's work as an undergraduate student uh, around 1996. And it was one of those really seminal moments in the life of a student and aspiring artist. Um, you know, as a student working with Clay, uh, Magdalene's work provided this really remarkable example of a kind of work and practice that was both deeply engaged in ideas of craft and tradition, and then actually through that engagement with craft and tradition feels absolutely vital and relevant um, for the contemporary art world. Um, I think to me, Adendo's work holds this quality that I think is true of, of maybe all really great art, where it feels at the same time, both very clear and also very complex. Um, so it's been about 25 years since I first encountered Adendo's work. And as Dave and Sanam and I were all discussing possible keynote speakers for this symposium, um, you know, Magdalene was at the very top of all of our lists. And we really feel that her work is both in direct conversation with these two exhibitions at the museum um, but also as we engage with these larger conversations that I think are most urgent right now within the arts and arts education, um, these issues of how we unpack the legacies of colonialism, um, how we build more diverse, inclusive and equitable institutions um, in these kind of vital, urgent conversations that we're engaging in right now, um, we really couldn't think of any artist who, who is more relevant um, to speak with us at CSU today. So please join me in welcoming Magdalene Adendo. Well, thank you very much. 
and thank you for the introduction. I always feel once an introduction that honors one so much more than I care to think. <laughs> um, sort of is is rather humbling and um so i I'll, I'll try and in in my presentation uh i think i've lost a screen are you there dale i yes, think i, I am yeah oh, okay uh patricia came on and i I got a bit confused. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, could I just say really quickly, Magdalene, is I, I'll continue letting people in from the waiting room, but as you guys come in, okay. if you could please mute your microphones. Thank you. Okay. So I I I think it's easier as as a practitioner. It's easier for me to speak with my presentation rather than uh, reading my notes uh, and um, then you know sort of deal with whatever questions there are in the in the question and answer time and if anybody wants to interrupt me do so I will I'll go straight to uh, and Dell if I make a mistake uh, help me there so that's uh okay share and perfect then play wonderful thank you okay so um okay i <clears throat> what i want to do is to just go through um a few biographical uh, uh, bits. I was born in Kenya, as everybody knows, and um, grew up uh, mainly at the coast of Kenya. And my my childhood was a little bit interrupted by uh, joining my my father, particularly my my mother and my siblings joined my father in India, where he was working, um, uh, and uh, we spent probably about three or four years uh, in India, started school in India and then came back to Kenya during the, towards the end of the uh, colonial rule, but, but also amidst a, a, a Mau Mau in, insurrection or rebellion or uh, as the British would have called it a terrorist organization. Now it, it's it's during the, the 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 last exhibition I had, which was a trigger for Dell inviting me to to do this presentation, <clears throat> the journey of things. I started reflecting on what it is that really informed my sensibility and my decision to do what I I was doing, because pottery and ceramics would not have been a natural um, a, a natural or the first sort of notion of my upbringing. My parents would never have thought of educating me to go and become a potter, a lawyer, yes, or a, a scientist or something like that. But on reflection, I feel that that period of coming back to Kenya uh, in 1956-57 and up to going, you know, having my education in Kenya was very complex because the, the freedom fighting and the freedom, the liberation movements were going on as we were interacting with the colonial government. There were times when it was very confusing for us children to know where you belonged and where you didn't belong. What was very um, evident and what I think a lot of Americans would relate to is the divisions on racial grounds. We had a system that totally subjugated the indigenous population by creating a stereotypical 
way of kind of categorizing people. So you had um, a, a, a colonial government that ruled by decree and were you know, sort of uh, gathering a whole lot of people from all the different groups and nations of Kenya and, and in, in a very tribal way and generated a, 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 a sort of a, an environment that created a divide and rule system. So here in this image here, you see uh, a whole lot of people gathered, called the Mau Mau, gathered and being taken to the prison with two British um, riflemen and, and um, uh, policemen guarding them. In the next um, image, this, this very confusing sort of image where you have and the Africans actually doing the same, taking, taking their uh, uh, instructions from the colonial government and actually subjugating their own people and rounding up people in these military camps. And that legacy that, we, that became so confusing for any of us young people still lives on much of the ills and problems that we have on the continent sort of are, for me and I, I i'm not a politician but for me can be traced back to this kind of period where the notion of uh, 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 a certain group of people, and they, the the colon, the colonial government, the British were very clever because they made alliances with certain uh, tribal groups who became the the uh, as we call them askaris, the the guards and people like that, and then made it seem like one tribe was against the other tribe. And it took up to 1963 for us to get our independence. So I just want you to understand that the, 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 fall, the decisions later on that I made were perhaps reflective. They, they may have been uh, uh, sort of kept in this little box for a while while I was uh, traveling and coming to England to be educated and exploded while I was at art school and doing the arts that I did. Because I first trained as a com in commercial art in an advertising agency. And it's not until I got to England that I realized that I really wasn't cut out to um, work in an industry that was so material orientated and uh, was very exploitative of the vast number of the population that had no means to, to even read or go and buy the Guinnesses and or the petrol that Shell uh, were advertising. So it was still socially, it became socially, as well as having to cope with the tribal um, uh, disparities we had and the tribal strifes that were created, we were now dealing with the an economics, uh, uh, an economic strife. So by the time I got to England, I had started having qualms about working in advertising agency and just being very uncomfortable with, with it. So I decided to, with the help, it wasn't a decision that I intelligently myself made, but with the help of uh, a few, some of my tutors, particularly uh, a lady called Zoe, who was working in the pottery department, I started going to make, to do printmaking and, and uh, pottery in evening classes. A um, few years later, I went to, uh, West Surrey College of Art, which was then Farnham Art College, and immersed myself in, 
in uh, the ceramics department. It was a great um, three years because it was very much based on uh, an American system of liberal arts. You could go from one department to the other. And then in your final year, you specialized in the area that you, you, you chose. So I, I would have done, I, in fact, I did a lot of printmaking, specializing in mezzo tinting and uh, some photography, a uh, uh, bit of jewelry, but I final, finally did my, um, um, I majored in ceramics with photography and printmaking as my second subject. Now this piece that I have here was instrumental to uh, the invitation from um, the Hepworth uh, Museum in uh, Wakefield in, York, in Yorkshire to in, you know, inviting me to, uh, first of all, to have an, a, a small exhibition which then developed into a, a, a sort of retrospective exhibition curated, but also with my involvement. But it, it's an important piece. It, for me, it is uh, a, a little bit embarrassing, but uh, a major piece because it, it was very derivative. Now, going back during the period of my first degree, I met, uh, we had a trip to West, the West country of England. And there I met people like Bernard Leach and Michael Cardew. During my visit to Michael Cardew's uh, pottery, and a lot of younger people may not, uh, may not know who these people are. Del, you have to explain to them later on. But Michael Cardew was very, um, instrumental in starting up a couple of pottery workshops in Ghana and in Nigeria during the colonial period. His biggest achievement was an, a, a pottery in Nigeria at Abuja, which is now the, the capital of, of uh, Nigeria. And there he, he uh, met a lady called Ladi Kwale, who is now being very highly celebrated and that several exhibitions on how I even curated an exhibition with a colleague of mine at uh, my alma mater recently. Um, and she, Michael Cardio introduced me to the pottery. And when I got there, I think he's, he was aiming for me to actually go and look at Nigerians, Nigerian art in general, uh, to be able to reassess what I wanted to do myself. And when I got there, I started working with these four women potters who were there, who also worked on the wheel, but continued to do, uh, to, to make uh, hand-built ceramics. By the time I arrived there, the hand-built ceramics they were making were <clears throat> being made in a stoneware clay and fired in, in, in a high fired, um, kiln, glazed, and so they, it, it, it was a little bit of a shock for me. When I came back to England, I then was trying to reinvent myself, reinvent the, the ceramics. You can see that this piece is made in a stoneware clay. It is glazed inside. I'm almost trying to stylize the decoration of the, the African um, or, you know, sort of Nigerian decorations, uh, scraffito method. I'm trying to get away from the, from making my, my pieces look like the pieces that were being made in the Gwari tradition, but not very successful. Nevertheless, they, there was, um, it was at a period when there was a lot of attention being paid to Africa, uh, Southwest Coast American, you know, the indigenous and the native pottery, Maria Martinez was uh, uh, being celebrated. So I was working within that framework and my work 
got noticed. So bear in mind that uh, now uh, my, my screen has frozen. What, what have I done wrong, Dell? <laughs> it's not moving. It's not moving now. Um, OK. Let's see. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's moving. What did you do? <clears throat> I just, I waited. I didn't do anything. <laughs> so, so I, you know, sort of if you, if, if I'm jumping now uh, about, uh, say, 35, 40 years on from that first piece, and then now with a res ret retrospective of this, the exhibition called Journey of Things, uh, because we would have to stay here all day if I started showing all the work that I made in between. And then, you know, sort of during my conversation, I may miss out uh, uh, nuances that you may want to recall in the questions and in conversation tomorrow. While we were designing the Journey of Things, one of the issues that I had is in 19, in, in 2017, I had all of a sudden fallen very, very ill on really doorstep, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I, 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 I was, it was 50-50 whether I lived or not because I uh, contracted a really bad sepsis that, uh, um, was was very critical. So I was being invited to have this exhibition while I was still in hospital. So when I came out, rather than you know having an exhibition of just my ceramics, uh, we decided to have all uh, you know this young curators, wonderful to work with, thirty something year olds because they, they've got a lot of brain I haven't got. And we came, he came, uh, Andrew came up with this notion of uh, doing the journey of things, which meant, you know, we'll, we'll recall some of the things, some of the objects, some of the art, some of the spaces that influenced my thinking. And one crucial thing when I was having a lot of uh, emotional, uh, conflict and, and problems in deciding what I wanted to do during the period of my foundation and trying to, and, and, and leaving advertising and commercial art was to spend a lot of time in museum. And Cambridge, fortunately, was a center very much like any of your universities. You have museums related to to the, the, the community and the environment there. So they had um, a place called Kettle's Yard, which was an, an, an exhibiting space that had a lot of uh, uh, 20th century um, artists who had been there. Uh, there was a, an American, I think, called Eid, who um, had settled in Cambridge and invited a lot of artists to come and work there. And I happened to see a piece of work by uh, Reshka Godier. Um, and I think that uh, there is a piece of his in the exhibition. And then, you know, I came out thinking, in fact, just on top of the, uh, um, the first page to, to my left, is uh, a piece of uh, Godier there. I came out of this uh, place, uh, this exhibition, Kettle's Yard, and thought to myself, oh, that's really good. Um, Cambridge and people from, you know, white people like African art. I'm, I had not thought of looking at labels to see who was what. So my, my sensibilities were, more, were very visual. I was trying to educate myself visually rather than uh, academically right at that point. And so the, that work becomes very crucial in my thinking because I start realizing that art has a universal language that can be understood by everybody. And so I'm exploring. So the exhibition starts kind of building up with the visual objects that I, I had looked at. I had 
been very interested. I still am interested in um, uh, early Egyptian work. You can see here uh, stone carvings, but work from uh, the Pacific and then 20th century work like the, the uh, Rodan and Dega sculptures. Uh, and um, there's an app there. And so we started then having this dialogue between the curators and myself, and we started uh, uh, working on the loan of things. There's, there are things like, there's a little cup there that Barbara Hepworth had in her studio. It is not very significant. It isn't classic, but it just shows so much movement. It is bigger than it, it, it is in my mind. And it's got this beautiful sensibility. It defies being a cup because it's sculptural at the same time. And you can actually see why Barbara Hepworth would have chosen it. So things like that become very important to me. You can see um, the African mixed with Henry Moore because we were all studying people like Henry Moore at that time. And when you then look at my forms later on, they develop, it wasn't instant and it wasn't uh, immediate. Uh, and so here we are planning this, this, the notion of an Elizabethan woman. This is a painting, an, Elizabeth, an Elizabethan painting of Queen Elizabeth. And for me, it isn't because it is a painting of the Queen, Queen Elizabeth. It's much more the form that is created within that painting. It is so sculptural, so voluptuous. So I'm starting to learn about space and, and objects. And, and that's very, very important. So you can see the piece here, which you'll see later, is absolutely derived from this notion of an Elizabethan woman walking with this huge cancan. Uh, and you can imagine why they did have baths for three to six months, because they were clothed in these, I think they went to bed like that and woke up like that. But it's quite nice to actually think of that as well. So the history of the, that object becomes the history that I imbue in my own work. Then we had to work, and I'm sure with the curation of this, the, these two exhibitions that you have, um, the designers and the, the, the curators and the, the, the students who are working there would have had ideas of how to place these objects with my, my own ceramics and the objects that I had chosen. I was very, very fortunate to have um, Rashid Msavi, who's a, a very, I, was just, I, I would say young architect, she teaches at in, in Britain and at Harvard come in and she's very exciting. I think she, she comes from the Middle East and she was very excited to work with us. And I think it needed an architect. And for the first time, I realized that working through an exhibition that has a kind of retrospective theme to it, but also challenging you to actually come forth with you know, your ideas that will be tested and people will ask, you know, they were, you know, sort of most of the time, uh, people were very interested in seeing how I thought, but one or two people would say, oh, I don't think all that influences and, and uh, um, inspiration come uh, uh, cut the ice and, and I think, uh, it's, it's mistaken because we're all influenced by our environment and by how, who we are. And identities, identities are so important. To find yourself within the work is much more. And to find yourself within the community that you, you came from, but the community that you've created later on is very important because none of our works exist without, uh, 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 you know, sort of that wider community. So the exhibition started off with this piece that 
was actually was very much in in the news because it had hit uh, an, uh, in the secondary market, which I pay very little attention to. It had come back onto the market and uh, was the highest ever sold uh, of a living ceramicist. And I looked back at the work and I, first of all, I couldn't actually really remember the work because I'd sold it in 1997, I think, uh, or yeah. And, and so I'd forgotten about it, but I know that when I was making it, I was actually gesturing a lot and getting on my tiptoes and doing things and wanting it to speak. When I first exhibited it, a lot of musicians felt it actually echoed music for them. Other people thought it was too, too harsh because it was very threatening. And, and those nuances became very important and are still very important. But if we dwell a little bit on this piece, you'll see that without the space around the piece, the piece becomes uh, null and void. But it needs that void and it needs that solidity. The piece itself is solid, but if it doesn't have the space around it, you don't see it. So I, I, I do believe so much um, in this containing and uncontaining as we human beings are contained in the in, in this world. There's something keeping time on me because I can... Um, so uh, you went into the other room and I had the whole uh, museum to myself. The first section was mainly of my work. And then the second, the, the next section was this juxtaposition with the other work. So here you have a little Jomon piece of work in the perspect dish, the perspect box here, and uh, a Kuba doll. And for me, the two uh, uh, perform the same uh, 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 functions because you have to do with, with life and, and, and then on the, on the other side you have two charges that were made in uh, 1800s and they're Thomas Toft English tradition, one of, for me, one of the highlights of English ceramics uh, or Brit yeah, English ceramics. And then you have the, the Queen's image, you have um, Yinka Shonabari's costumes and Yinka is very interesting because and complex at the same time because he too works on this identity issue where he's taken uh, the issue of colonial material that were made and, and, and became known as African print. In effect, they were printed in Holland and in Manchester. At the back, you've got a beautiful, beautifully handwoven uh, uh, Kentic cloth. So, uh, you know, sort of things went there. You've got the uh, Gordia Breshka work, and you've got the the uh, um, Rodan and uh, Arp, I think. But you, you know, sort of, we can talk endless about. The, the juxtapositions, and there's the dagger. And I just love this, the pose, the, the arrested position of that uh, uh, piece of work. And, and when I work in my own studio, those are the poses that I want to arrest in my own work. And here you have, a, a very interesting piece of work by Ella Natsui, who has taken, who's, who's totally inspired by Kente cloth, but actually has taken contemporary materials and recycled material to make this absolutely stunning piece of work. Uh, and the two pieces went together. Then I had a section which recalled 
uh, like you know, sort of, uh, I'm very fascinated by, by, by the life cycle and particularly the rites of passage to do with death. Uh, and and I come from a society where death is a very important aspect of life, and death does not mean finality in in in, in human. In, in human terms, it just means a transition to the ancestral world. And it may, it, it, it's not that many of the societies believe that you're physically there, but it's that the spirit and the spirit of us human beings lives and roams between the two. Um, a very good friend of mine, uh, Julian Stair, made <coughs> this huge piece of work and that was made uh, very much uh, as part of his uh, exhibition called Quetus, which was to do with uh, uh, um, basically making funer funereal pieces where you, you, you would be, this, this is the, two, the, the casket, you'll be buried in there. Um, and these pieces of mine, they, they derive from uh, um, memorials called Vigangos in, in, at the coast of East Africa, which are memorial pieces made from wood uh, to celebrate the, the dead. Um, here you've got... Um, uh, I'm forgetting the, the hand scopers and uh, a, a little uh, wrist knife there that comes from uh, uh, southern uh, Sudan, which, uh, if you look closely, has is related to the tops of of that piece, and then some bronze work here um, as well. I also have worked in other medias and I made this piece in Tacoma in, in Washington um, and it's called uh, um, Metamorphosis and Transformation. And again, in whatever I do, there is always a historical aspect of it. These pieces were made after I had uh, done some research at um, an archaeology museum in London called the Petrie and discovered these very, very tiny ear uh, pieces that were found in, in the tombs. And they were made of glass. This glass was made, you know, sort of about 5000 BC. And it was just incredible to think that our crafts and art has existed for centuries. So there's absolutely nothing that we do that is really new. We just reinvent ourselves within the, uh, the, the, the work that we make. Um, and as the pieces were being made and grew, the title came from actually the audience and um, uh, the audience started talking about, oh, they are morphing and and transforming, so um, uh, that came from there. So this this is the main exhibition in Tacoma, and then the engagement with glass became a, 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 a an obsession. I spent nearly three four years just working in glass and made this piece called. Hey. Sorry. Sorry. Um, transition to made of made of 1001 glass pieces and i wanted them all made in the same way because i wanted to celebrate the craftsmanship that is often uh, negated um, for uh, art sake and um, the beauty of watching people glass blowing, but actually making this repetition movement, it's almost religious and almost like getting into a frenzy um, of a dance uh, 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 movement. And um, in this particular exhibition, which was part of the journey of things, it is uh, um, 
sort of inspired by a uh, uh, murmuration of sterlings when they they come into Britain. And this was at its first uh, exhibition, but it, you know, sort of, and then I, th I thought I'd show some of my work and um, I don't know what to say about the work. I'll wait for questions then. And, and much of the work kind of in, in terms of dimensions range from uh, 30 centimeters in the early days, but now they've gone to about 60, uh, 60 to 65 centimeters. So that is uh, maybe a couple of uh, two feet in, in American terms. So these were the ones that were very influenced by the Elizabethan costumes. I'm not sure where that came from. But this is one of my uh, favorite pieces. It is in in uh, the Nelson Atkins uh, uh, Museum in, uh, I think that's in Kansas, is it? Is it? But um, what I loved about this piece is when I first showed it in Holland, uh, the person who, the, the author who had written in the catalog brought his wife to see the exhibition and she was expecting a baby pretty much soon. And she went, she left and went ahead. You know, the minute she saw the piece, she said to me, oh, she, she thinks her baby is arriving. And I love, I, I, I like the fact that the work um, often takes, you know, so in terms of uh, uh, people, people can take whatever they, they feel from the work, but the the body and particularly the female body as a carrier, as a carrier of life, has actually been one of my biggest uh, muse and my biggest inspiration. So much of the work echoes that containment and uncontainment of life, breath, and and death as well. This was an exhibition at uh, Gainesville at the Hahn Museum in Flor Gainesville, Florida. And this was at Long House, Long House Reserve in the Hamptons. Um, if any of you want to look up uh, Jack Lenore, he started this wonderful uh, place in, in the Hamptons. And um, it, it really it has a lot of art in the grounds, but uh, a, a beautiful collection. Um, that work was there as well. Uh, this is going, uh, this is later on. This is an exhibition in 2013 in Belgium. And here I deliberately have put this uh, piece in. This is a healing part from the Benue Plateau in, in Nigeria. And sometimes uh, it, it, it is not the fact that uh, a piece derives from uh, uh, a direct uh, influence, but uh, the spirit of it and the notion of this healing part that is being used by the healer to cure whatever ails the person is very important. And ceramics is one of the few, clays, one of the few materials really that can capture that humanity that, uh, that uh, exists 
within its parameters of making work. Because here is a healing, a part that is used by a healer and, um, and it's beautifully made. It's so contemporary. It doesn't lose its, its uh, quirkiness, but it, it, it has a utility to it. It probably was made um, with that horror of being ill as, as the mouth shows, uh, but it's, it's just stunningly beautiful. Um, and, and, and my attempt to arrest that stillness in, in my own work. This is a piece now at the Design Museum in Munich in Germany. And uh, these are two pieces that were made as memorials for my, uh, my father and my mother. And they, I'm glad to say I sit in Munich uh, as well. And they just have a tiny, you know, hole at the top to, to let the souls breathe. Uh, these I made, made when I was an uh, artist in residence at the Clay Studio in Philadelphia. And this is my very recent exhibition. In fact, it just finished in January. Uh, and it was an exhibition called Brancusi and Magdalene Odundo. Um, and the, the gallerist has always loved Brancusi's work and has always associated the, the patinas uh, obtained. It wasn't so much that the work echoed each other's work, but that the, there was always an obsession with Brancusi on surfaces. And that is something that has come to define my work. I, I make with a very rudimentary technique and then spend a lot of time uh, trying to get rid of the, the marks um, uh, on, on that I have made. Uh, and I'm not sure why, if you ask me, uh, other than um, I cannot um, uh, visualize them not, not having this smooth surface. I think it also is the technique that I use and also the firing because I think the firing um, uh, finishes the work and if it was, if they were uh, rough and with the marks on, uh, they would be different. And I think if you look at uh, Pueblo pottery and some indigenous work, or you looked at a bronze piece of work, there's also always an amount uh, 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 an, an amount of hand refining on, on the piece of work. Uh, and I think glazes do that for people who have the knowledge to use glazes that are appropriate to their work. And I'm gonna finish soon, but this, this is a piece that just sold in November last year and again reached heights in terms of price um, and as Garth Clark um, said, you know, sort of one dead person because uh, Volker's piece also made history and this piece made history. I wish it was mine. The money did not come to me. Um, I also want to show you the other aspects. Drawing is very important to me and uh, it feeds and informs the work. And here again, the relationship between uh, a drawing and, and, and the spacing of, of the drawing, but also the work, the, the um, three-dimensional work. Uh, printmaking, I mentioned as well. Um, uh, I had, I'm, I've been very fortunate to have residencies in different places in the world, but this was a printmaking residency. And uh, from that residency, I've been able to collaborate with uh, a, a fashion designer and um, the secret is almost uh, about to go out of the, the collaboration. Uh, 
This is a work I made on the wall at uh, Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, a place that I have often visited and I love dearly. And they allowed me to uh, ruin their wall uh, but it was the first time I made a, a, a deliberate mural. Um, and this, um, the exhibition at Dartmouth College also included a dinner service. And I'm sorry about the image because you can't see it, but it's an autobiographical piece that I made. It now resides in at the High Museum in Atlanta. And it, it, it was a piece very much influenced by the notion of uh, medallions that were uh, are exhibited in a museum in England called the Russell Coates Museum. And uh, uh, Queen Victoria had uh, her, her family tree um, made, you know, sort of drawn in ceramics in little medallions and used uh, uh, magenta as the color um, and, and magenta became known in industry as the raw color. But what I did with my piece is to, to kind of take an industri industrial uh, dinner service, transform it with uh, um, William Morris designs decapitate those designs or deconstruct them, put them on my, my dinner service and mix them with portraits of my, my family. So when people came in, they, they at first thought they were looking at a Royal Dalton tea set. As they got very close to it, they saw portraits of uh, African people. And that kind of, in terms of identity, reminded me very much of the 70s when I arrived in England and um, certain parts of England were still very um, uh, sort of in, you know, sort of unfamiliar with uh, other races. And um, it was a difficult two years for me. Uh, but uh, this this uh, dinner service uh, just kind of did that. But it was very interesting watching um, uh, the audience come in and be surprised at the work. Uh, that's frozen again. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to show you um, this fashion designer, JW and Jonathan Anderson, who's uh, a young designer, he's only about 35 and has hit the road, uh, but is absolutely um, uh, interested in his garments, um, having this, um, you know, sort of working with the body. And he was the first person invited to the Hepworth to curate his own show. And at the back there, he, he um, sort of, he, he loves my work and he, he used my work as he used Hans Koper and other pieces of work. The exhibition he had was called Disobedient Bodies. And if you, if you can uh, look that up, it was very interesting. And it's his, his designs, his, his, actual uh, individual designs are very interesting. Uh, and I'm going to end with just some, uh, again, my engagement with things to do with the body and things to do with, the, with people um, are very valuable to me. This is a headdress worn by Tukana people in North um, Western Kenya around Lake Tukana and, um, you know, sort of, I, I, I think you, you look at this and you look at uh, sort of Western traditions of wigs in, in uh, Victorian or even earlier times uh, where men actually are the ones who wore elaborate 
elaborate wigs and elaborate costumes. They wore tights. If you look at paintings, right from, you know, sort of uh, uh, classical paintings of 15th century, you'd see men, men actually beautifully dressed and with beautiful, colorful tights. Uh, the women obviously were always uh, half naked and uh, with boobs out, but um, the, the tradition of, of adornment is very alive and rich within those traditions that are still um, able to practice their traditions in Africa, although uh, many of them are becoming museum pieces like this piece. Uh, mo much of it would have been, the, the, the crown itself would have been made out of uh, human hair. This piece is just absolutely stunning. It's uh, antique, you know, sort of in terms of Africa, it's, uh, it's old, it comes from that uh, group, the Benue people, the, the healing pots. And for me, if you look at any of our contemporary uh, ceramics, uh, this is, fits in beautifully there, but it also fits in, in the classic. Uh, uh, the balance is just amazing. Um, it has this cruciform to it. It can you can you can kind of gain a lot of mileage in in finding associations that are universal in 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 its um, sort of making. And it for me it just spells out the beauty of making objects and the importance of uh, of making any kind of uh, um, form of art or literature. And I end with just to show you that I had, you know, sort of uh, the vessel is at the core of my um, uh, trajectory, the, the core of my thinking and whatever I make has to be hollow. Uh, I feel it's necessary to have this uh, inside and outside, and even if it's closed, the, the notion of containing and uncontaining is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Magdalene, for that really I'm sorry, incredible- I took, I, I took a lot of, I took more time than I should have. Not at all, it was perfect. We spent a little bit more time than we'd planned to on the introduction. So that was just, yeah, amazing. Such a generous, um, wide ranging talk. Um, and, and, uh, so thank you so much. I know it's, it always feels like one of the strange things about giving a talk like this <laughs> online. I feel like we should just hold space for applause right now. The, the virtual applause, which were, I'm sure everyone is is giving you at this moment. Um, uh, so I guess to follow now, we have some questions. Um, and these questions were submitted before the talk, actually, by students um, in the uh, ceramics, sculpture, and um, and uh, and pottery classes at CSU. We've been doing some readings about your work over the last few weeks, and and talking about your work and the students have been preparing these questions. Um, do you want to unshare your screen or stop sharing? Uh, okay, uh, what, I okay. Think it's that button stop. at the top of the right. screen. Yeah, the right. stop share, perfect. Yeah, let me see. Thank you for that. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, it's nice to see everyone's faces again. Um, so yeah, again, these, these questions were submitted before the talk and um, it, it's a little, um, strange, maybe also encouraging, you know, I feel like many of the ideas you actually covered already and addressed in the talk. So maybe they're kind of prompts to, um, you know, elaborate on some of the things you've already brought up. Um, uh, I also, just to bring another voice into the conversation, um, I asked for volunteers among the students to help in asking the questions. And so, um, I'm going to unmute one of our students. Um, I've got a slight cough, so if I cough. No I'm going to un un unmute our um, student, Derek Nyback, if he's still here, and he's going to help me um, in asking these questions. 
Um, but maybe we can just start out. I was reading through the questions and kind of thinking about some of the some of the maybe key ideas you brought up in the lecture. And maybe we can start with this question. This comes from a student in Haley Bates, um, Professor Haley Bates' metalsmithing class. Um, this is from Kelsey Gruber. And um, she asks, what, what, struck, what struck her as most interesting about your work is this notion of the way that you um, play with people's interpretation of your work. I'm not sure if that's a quote from one of the readings or a quote from you. Um, and then Kelsey adds, because of the stark contrasting themes in your work, um, it evokes a lot of different emotion and reaction from viewers. The simplicity in the work makes room for wider interpretation, um, even though your practice is so um, complex. Um, so her question is, how does the materiality in your other work, your prints and installations, maybe the glasswork also that you, we saw, how does that directly tie to your ceramic practice? <coughs> I think, <coughs> I'm trying to think how to, <coughs> excuse me, how to frame that. Hmm. Good question. I think <coughs> <coughs> opening up the work to allowing people to interpret the work is in a way a liberation for me. I don't have to, I don't have to, um, have a template of what I'm going to make next. But I, I could, you know, I could hear birds singing outside and be influenced by that and hope that the viewer is able to, to find music in that and music that is pertaining to, to that. Uh, with a glass, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just going to get a, more water. No problem. And Kelsey, I'm noticing I'm seeing you on the screen here, and um, I'm just going to go ahead and unmute your microphone and Maybe when Magdalene's finished with her initial um, response, you know, if you have any follow-ups or you can let us know if that got to the question that you were, you were hoping to ask. We'll just take a short break. Ooh, I'm so sorry, Chelsea. I'm back. Yeah, I, I, think, I think, you know, I, I hope that most of us make work with a certain interpretation and intent, but hope that the, 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 the baggage that we bring into the work itself does not deter um, the audience or the viewer to make to make up their own mind. There, there was one stage I started being encouraged to, to title my work. And I stopped that because I felt that the titles did not give the person or the people, did not give the audience enough time to look at the work. Right? And I just thought, um, I mean, what can you say when you look at, uh, when you're standing in, in, in a bus queue or, a, or on a train waiting for your train and you see a whole lot of people bustling around, you know, sort of, you know that, that, you know, we're all human beings, we're all people, but everybody has their own different expressions and movement. And that's the exciting part of the, 
the, the, the, our world that the form is centrally a human form, but that it has its variants. Does that say anything? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's perfect. I'm kind of, I'm, you know, sort of, I wasn't trying to avoid it, but it is a very, it's a really good question. It's a very uh, uh, a loaded question because what do I mean when I say, you know, sort of, I want my pieces to have this space where, you know, the, the, the outside space informs the, the, the form itself. What do I mean? What I mean is that when you come in and you you feel like making music, you you know, like somebody said, you know, they went back to their to their attic to find their their trumpet and started playing again. I think that's the biggest honor, the greatest honor you can you can feel that you you have achieved if if you move somebody to kind of have to recall something that was uh, important to their life. And this person was a doctor who hadn't played for 25 years. So I think Chelsea, that for me, that is a good question, but it's also a very difficult question to, uh, to answer in, you know, in, in, in one sentence. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Magdalene. Um, I just wanted to say really quickly, I see some great questions actually coming up in the chat right now. Um, I just wanted to say, well, we will have some time tomorrow after the symposium um, to take questions from, from the larger audience, you know, beyond these CSU student groups. So I'll, I'll hold on to these questions from today as well that are coming from the chat and we'll make sure to try to bring them into the conversation after the symposium tomorrow. Just to um, and remind everyone of the structure of the two conversations over the two days. Um, Derek, I was wondering if you want to jump in with a question now, either either the question that you had for Magdalene, or if you see any others on the on the list of student questions that you feel might be relevant for this point in the conversation. Yeah, um, <clears throat> my question was a little bit shorter than the other one. Uh, I was simply was asking them. What suggestions to artists of color and how, what suggestions do you have to artists in color and how they navigate the art space? And that uh, encompasses creating art, displaying art, discussing art and selling art. Uh, because I personally feel that, um, especially in America, I mean, we, I feel that artists of color exist in a different space and we may share the space with you know, people who are white or whatever, but how we, how we operate in those spaces, um, what we bring to the table, how we bring to the table, how I say things to someone who is not a person of color when talking about my art, that might be different in a way that I speak to someone who's a person of color about my art. Like, what do you, what suggestions do you have for us and in, in how we just operate in our day-to-day -day lives? you know, creating and working and, and talking about these things? Uh, that's tough and I don't have a magical wand. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I, if, if you recall, I started off deliberately with those two images because those two images are very, you know, sort of very, and I only have started, and it, this is the first time I've used them, and I think I've used them because of the environment that we live in and because of ML, you know, sort of Black Lives Matter. Um, because, you know, sort of a few years ago in 2007, 2008, I deliberately went to Ghana to celebrate or to remember, it wasn't a celebration, to remember that Ghana was the first, uh, one of the first countries in Africa to get independence, but also the Elmina Castle. Uh, and I was deliberate, I deliberately went to Elmina Castle on that day of 200 years of the abolition of slavery. Uh, because it was important to me and and my work, and I have, I have to live, 
I deliberately wanted to celebrate the work through the making and through acknowledging uh, the traditions that I came from. And the question of identity has always been there. And though my work has, is not pictorially or in text, overtly um, shouting out the pain and all that, all the contortions in the work are to do with identity. It's managed to reach beyond my expectations. My hope at the moment is that the movement of you young people is a lot more uh, um, liberal, but more educated and more forward thinking. And, and they may not be, you know, sort of, the readily available palette of galleries uh, uh, showing work, but I think there is a lot more work being shown within the diaspora, the African diaspora, the Black person diaspora. Who, who would have thought that you'd have, I forget the name of this young girl who was reading her poetry during <clears throat> inauguration, I mean, what, what power, what more power would you want? I mean, for, for an art to, exp to, to, to show the universality of language, of poetry. And if that doesn't hit the right cause, then I don't know where we, we, we're heading for as human beings. But there is, there is a big movement in, in, in reality. There's a big movement here in Britain. I don't know how much in the States, but I see a lot of gallery exhibiting a lot more <clears throat> uh, diaspora young, young people. We are no longer the, the, the talking point. And it will come with you know, sort of just being true to, to, to your own art and making your art be what it is and be itself. People, you know, sort of people out there will, will, will see it. I don't think we can force uh, the, the, <clears throat> the philosophical um, thinking of the way the galleries are set up, but we can influence them. And we can make, you know, sort of, we can make our own art. I know that Nsika is actually working very hard to, to enable a lot of arts um, within the minority groups or the unheard, or, you know, the, the groups that are not heard from. And <clears throat> I know, I've, you know, because I've contributed a bit to that. So we have movements that are doing that, but ultimately it's the work that has to speak for itself. You know, I was really surprised when, you know, sort of I was doing my, during my graduate exhibition, uh, <clears throat> when, you know, because everybody, all my colleagues were running around like mad trying to get the best spot to exhibit their work. I was always last minute and I just said, okay, you know, if glass and ceramic want me to be in the middle, I'm happy to do that. Well, on behold, you know, sort of everybody who was coming on all different ang angles could see my work. So it was luck within that as well. But you have to then maintain the integrity of the work. And I work hard towards that. I don't always make the best work because each time I make a piece of work, I want to improve on it. I don't know, long way to, long shot to trying to, to, to um, answer that. But I think we must, we must, you and all of us must go out and encourage, you know, sort of uh, young people not to just go into sports, but to look at art as a means of, of, being themselves and finding their identities much more and, and being part of the community because we are known for theater, sports and all these and, and, and um, 
become, you know, sort of become stereotypical of that. But I think the arts need, um, you know, we need to work a little bit hard towards that. And I hope I'm part of that. Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. You, Magdalene. You know, this, this is another question. I'm kind of looking through all the questions um, from students here. And this is another one um, that, that maybe relates to the, to the conversation that Derek has brought in, but in a, in a slightly different way. Um, this question comes from Ren McDonald, who's a student in the pottery class, um, the pottery concentration. And her question is, um, what do you think about um, appropriation of ideas, thoughts, concepts, works, and history versus misappropriation. Um, I understand that we do not ever make work in a vacuum. So how do you navigate these two factors in your work? Um, what is okay and not okay to appropriate? And when should we proudly own the relation of our works to other works? Um, Perhaps this has to do with the culture's view of intellectual collaboration versus competition. I think that answers it actually, <laughs> the last sentence. <clears throat> and what I was talking with Derek as well, kind of uh, um, comes there. I mean, appropriation and misappropriation is, is a, uh, uh, a set, a mindset thing. That's why I deliberately showed that healing part and my piece against that, because um, for me, when I was making that piece, I really, I mean, I struggled with that piece because I struggled with the base of that piece. And it, in the end, I actually made it uh, upside down. But I was so moved by this, notion of healing, uh, notion of a pot being a carrier of uh, the concoction, the, the medicine that is being brewed, the, the cooking, but also just as, as a piece of work that was, you, when you look at that traditional piece, it doesn't look like it's utilitarian at all. It's more to do with sculpture, but it is, in terms of psych psychologically, it is a healing piece. So in a way I, I was, you could say I was appropriating the idea. I think misappropriation comes when one tries to be somebody else and there's a guilt Involved, for me, there's a guilt involved in it. And um, I, I, I mean, that's why I don't do any graffiti on my work because I, I, I actually haven't got the knowledge to be able to, to write poetry on my pieces or to write pic pictographs or hieroglyphs on my work. Um, it's, it's a tough one that I think, um, I, collaborations indeed, but I think art as artists, we have to come and work from where we are and what it is we want to, because all we are doing is actually, a, a, um, sort of, um, getting out what it is that is inside that makes us into the work that we make. And if we want to celebrate um, our own selves, we have to keep making that way. But it is, you know, I'm finding it, I'm finding it a very difficult question to, to, to navigate really. Um, I don't have the answers for that. I think that was a pretty good answer. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Thank I, I don't know the answers either. I think that is a really difficult question. <laughs> it, it, it is difficult because you're really, um, 
I mean, I think, you know, sort of performance, it, performance, performance arts are easier to actually do that. I mean, when you enact a Shakespeare, an, a Shakespearean play, you are actually uh, doing what Shakespeare wrote and you're acting that you may bring in your own body and your own feeling of it, but it's still a Shakespearean piece of work, whether you make it from Tanzania, where Nyerere translated one of the Shakespearean plays in Kiswahili, or whether you're in America. I think it's, it's, it's a language that, that lends itself to that. But um, particularly with contemporary art, you find, um, you know, sort of, you find that, um, I think to cut, to, to make things short, I think for me, if you if, if copying is just taking a piece of work from uh, uh, um, a position where you actually do not understand the, the place where you're coming from, um, I think you can then mis misappropriate and misinterpret it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But if you then go, if you do your research and you go and you work with it, you're going to produce work that means something to you. And it will kind of uh, have a appropriateness of who you are. And therefore, when people look at it, they will not associate it with somebody else but you. Thank you. I expect an essay from you of, on that. <laughs> and I, I will mark it for you. <laughs> okay. that's, a, that's an amazing invitation, Ran. I think we should take up Magdalene on that. Um, I, don't, I don't know, Derek, if you had a thought about a next question. I, I was kind of thinking about, you know, there's a question that comes from, um, Emily Yodis, who is another student in Professor Bates' metalsmithing class. And um, it, it, it kind of gets into, um, I think, a few of the, few of the ideas that, that you know, we've been talking about already and that you've been bringing up in, in your work, Magdalene. And uh, Emily asks, she says, I find the forms that you create to be very interesting and attention grabbing. The shapes are smooth, but intricate. And I think that being able to create such simple designs while still making them visually compelling is impressive. My question is related to this. Even though art has been created for so long, how can these forms with such simple decorative elements be considered original and new? I, I, I think original, uh, is is a little bit <clears throat> more difficult. New, I think, because they're being made by me. That's that's e e easily answered because everything you do uh, becomes history. Uh, uh, at the point you you're making or your your thinking, the past becomes history. What you're on is new because you're making, you're rethinking, you're reforming. As to originality, I think I have I have battled with this question, particularly in my in in my many years of teaching, where uh, the notion of uh, if if you know you're probably all too young to remember there was a period when it was quite uh, interesting art. You could make art by just lying on the road and rolling around and leaving marks and <laughs> and photographing it and that could be art and it's still the same but it's not original because if you look at cave paintings if you look at early work people were doing that so i don't think it's original what is original is what we put in the work 
and like science i mean if if you look at you know, if you if you listen to scientists they'll tell you they found something they usually are found finding something after researching through a historical context because we've had viruses before the new introduction the new vaccinations are going to be new but they're not that original because they've been based on the his past history. That's my take to it. And my take is um, everything that is being made today is new because it's being re renewed by your interpretation to it. But um, I remember uh, some years back, I was talking to a student who was really struggling and she, she um, kind of had the notion, she was trying to, um, she was very interested in Picasso's uh, ceramics. And as you know, Picasso did not make a piece of ceramics, it was made for him. And then he painted it. And I thought, what she had was really very interesting because it it was bringing a new dimension to the uh, to a tradition where the wheel was the strongest um, art, you know, sort of way of making. But she was very disillusioned because she kept saying, you know, sort of she's trying to make original work, and I I kept saying, well you know, sort of you'll find if you want to make a chicken, somebody else has made a chicken before, you know, in clay, that's in clay. So what you, you're going to have to do is to make that clay chicken do something that you want it to do that will be different from what was made before. But the, no, the, 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 cr the crux of the matter is somebody else 10,000 years ago had made a chicken before. So you find this is where museums are just amazing places. You can find cows, you know, being made in all traditions differently, but ultimately they are all cows in clay. <laughs> I hope that that is a reasonable reply. I don't think we have Emily on the call for a follow up. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll assume that oh, was a brilliant we... reply. Yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> oh, she's brought, probably hiding. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, th this next question comes from a student in um, Professor Mark Deneen's sculpture class. This is from Kenzie Corey. Um, she asks, how does the form of one of your pieces come to fruition? Can you walk us through your process of using your spheres of influence to create your personal ideas for the forms in your pieces? Oh, this is what, what, when I wish, you know, the, con the symposium was going to be as we, had, as we had planned. So I would have done a demonstration there. Very easy, I oh, simply... I think that's your daughter. <laughs> it's William. Yeah, sorry about that. Didn't mute in time. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, if if you could, if if my audience could imagine, um, I think Dave actually might Dave might have better, you know, sort of uh, information and uh, and and. Uh, videos probably of people making uh, work. But my approach is usually, I learned in Nigeria how to work standing up and walking around the piece. So I start with a lump of clay and then I, 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 I dig the clay out and hollow it and very quickly come up to, to uh, a rudimentary form and then start shaping from there. Um, and you can make you can make square or triangle pieces very easily that way because I, I I made a, a, a square piece when I was in Chile, um, but and and then I start using I don't use coils in the name in the same sense that you roll out or you extrude coils I take I dig out 
a, a lump of clay and make a, a rudimentary coil and add to it and walk around the piece. And until it starts, um, it gets to the height I want and then take shapers out, you know, sort of made out of coconut or goods and start shaping from the inside. So most of the time I'm working from the inside and hoping that the inside form informs the outside. And then when I come to, it's so damn complicated to explain how to make a work in the air. <laughs> it's so I, simple I'm, yet so complicated. I, I am, should add I that there are such some- a simple, I'm such a vi um, practical person that I can't, you know, visualize making gestures, you know, sort of, of how to shape and make the top and, uh, it was a brilliant, it's a brilliant description that you're giving though, I have to say. <laughs> Very badly. There, there are some beautiful, I'm not sure how many of you all in the audience are, are in Fort Collins, um, but um, Dave has included and the students have included some amazing videos within the Shattering Perspectives exhibition. I don't know, Dave, if you want to bring up anything to say about that or yeah they might be able to help us i think Has i unmute sorry dave i think i, I think muted you did i unmute you now yeah. sorry yeah i think so um yeah i finally it's... figured out how to mute and now i can't figure out how to unmute <laughs> <laughs> no it's uh it's fine um i would say you know magdalene the, the way that you're explaining it is is exactly what 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 anyone would would likely come across when looking at a lot of these, especially hand-built traditions that you find across the African continent. So for me, my perspective is always coming from the historical side of things. And like Del was mentioning, we, uh, myself and the student curators, many of who are here today, uh, included some video footage in the gallery space alongside the vessels, just to give a glimpse of some of these different approaches. Um, the majority of them come from uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Christopher Roy. Uh, who, oh yeah, I knew him. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, I studied with him at the University of Iowa. And if anyone out there uh, wants to see, he has, um, before his passing, he uploaded. Oh tons, yes, tons tons beautiful, of, beautiful, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'll drop a couple links uh, to, to some of his uh, documentary footage uh, for pot making. Uh, I've done a few myself, but but his really are, are kind of the gold standard to really get a, a good in-depth idea of how artists across the continent are coming up with these really phenomenal, innovative, hand-built uh, methods and techniques. So I'll drop that into the chat. Yeah, and also for for younger younger people who who probably don't know somebody like Volkos or Paul Sodner, um, it, 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 you know, sort of if kind of forget that you're looking at hand building in, in a traditional society. But if you look at the way either of those worked, you see how hand building is, is sort of a very constructive and constructed way of working. And, and I think some of the inspiration I got was very much because we had Paul Sodna come to to visit our college at some stage, but also just watching videos of, of, of Volkos because he was very influential in my period of, of how to, how getting off the wheel became so um, crucial in, in the way my generation started thinking about um, tools and using, you know, sort of none, in you know sort of momentum wheels to to make but there are also some wonderful videos of korean and japanese way of hand building where they're building these especially korea these huge kimchi pots on on a non-momentum wheel so in the end you know sort of from the question chelsea and 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 derek and all the people asked before you know sort of in terms of um how you make something becomes just a, a vehicle or a technique that enables you, 
you know, sort of the, the trick or the important thing is to adapt it to how you make rather than try to make how the other person is making. Because even when you're throwing on the wheel, it's very impossible to throw exactly the way somebody else does throw. You have to adapt it. So I encourage students to have a look at, uh, there is, I think there is, there are a couple of videos of me making, but I'm not sure that I, I know where they are, um, but. <laughs> um. I'm just, I'm really fascinated personally by the way you're describing, you know, this, this uh, kind of influence and history of, of, of processes that you've brought into your work and to speak about um, you know, both Volkes and also Mata Ortiz uh, yes. ceramics and also Korean Ongi. I, I feel like often in contemporary ceramics, you know, when we talk about this shift of moving off the wheel, many times the story is told primarily through Volkes, um, but, but the way in which in your work it feels like it folds in both 20th century artists, but also indigenous traditions. I don't know, I find that the, the way you're telling that story to be so rich and important. Yeah, and I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, Volkos, particularly coming from, from a, a sort of uh, Greekish uh, background would have studied some of the Cretan and early you know, sort of gigantic pieces. You couldn't have made those on a wheel. They were, they were uh, a combination of both. Um, and I think we need to encourage students to feel free to be able to manipulate. I mean, clay is just so forgiving and so uh, exacting as well. But if you if you work with it, you know, you 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 can do anything. I mean, we live in in clay houses, you know, bricks are soil and clay and, and whatever. So. Um. Maybe this next question, I mean, in a way you've answered this incredibly generously already, but it still, it feels like such a, such an interesting and important question. Maybe, maybe just to give it, you know, give it even more um, space. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by, by this question and and the way you're speaking to it. But this question comes from Anne Geis, another student in the pottery class. And she just asks, um, in what way does your work inform your process of making? And in what ways does your process of making inform your work? Um, how have you navigated this connection throughout your time as a working artist? Um, process meaning material selection as well as your use of that material. Uh, a really good question. But material selection is very important because unless you're comfortable with the material you're using, um, it's impossible. I, for instance, cannot, you know, sort of get round porcelain, <laughs> I, I, you know, to, to coil with porcelain. I just find it I, I find the dust that is made from white clay impossible to, I mean, I'm sure I make enough dust with red clay as well. So I think it's important to really, I, I, to cut a story short, I spent almost two years of my graduate, I, I did a three year graduate course at the Royal College when you know things were much more generous uh, on a ground in my own studio and 24 hours, you don't get that now. But I really spent time researching clays and trying to understand the property of clay, the difference between what we call uh, um, changa, which is soil, and udongo, which is clay. You know, udongo is for forming and Changa is for walking on. It's you, you can't make anything out of it. But uh, it is it is important to the extent that now I can adapt to to you know I know the percentages that I need to. The only thing I have never been able to resolve is the lime in red clay. You know I keep getting pop, pop up, but 
really the clay in the end um, informed what I ended up making because I did a lot of experiments on types of clay and the type of work that I was going to make. I, I at one stage was very interested in uh, uh, Egyptian turquoise uh, surfaces. And so I started trying to make that low fired clay. And my, at, at, at the time when I was at the Royal College, I was thinking that I was going to go back to Kenya and set up a pottery. So I needed to use materials that were not expensive and that wouldn't cost fuel wise uh, um, um, a compromise in what I wanted to make. And so I, I became so interested in having this minimal and you know, sort of finding a clay that fired the color that I wanted. And, and, and then, you know, sort of the fire, the types of firing I wanted to, to develop. And, and the fact that when I have a bunch of work out there, it's never, even when it's fired in an electric kiln, it's never finished until I fired in, in my saga kiln. So I think the material is very important. And just understand, you don't have to kind of struggle with formulas and knowing, you know, sort of, and, uh, and, and being an expert um, in, 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 you know, sort of the minutiae of, uh, of materials. But if you don't know what um, carbon, uh, uh, barium carbonate is going to do to the clay, if you don't know how much cobalt to add to your, your slip, uh, you're never going to get, um, I mean, it's okay for, uh, and, and as you know, clay has become a very uh, expansive uh, material for everybody. Everybody's working in clay. I mean, at one stage, only us potters worked in clay. But now, you know, you go to Venice Biennale, you go to Tifa, you go everywhere. Everybody's making clay pots you know, sort of, and, and, and they've trained in sculpture. So um, there, is, there is the notion that you can slap things on uh, and get certain effect, but the thing you're slap, slapping on, somebody else has made huge experiments to find out what color, what materials you need to get pink and what. So I think it is very relevant. I'm informed by the materials. And I inform the, 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 the work that I make uh, by having made that choice. And I deliberately made a choice to kind of be very Spartan in, in the clay material that I used and the type of firing I did, because I do not have the capacity to do maths and do all those wonderful glazes. <laughs> And I wanted the freedom to be able to make shapes and forms that, you know, sort of, I didn't have to chisel out a kiln, a kiln shelf because my pot has stuck on the kiln shelf. <laughs> I had to leave that for cleverer people than me. I think we have time for maybe one, just one more question. Um, Derek, would you like to jump in again and read this last one? Sure, no problem. Uh, this last question comes from Kate Zinda. She is a student in the ceramics program here at CSU. And Kate asks, has the art made at the beginning of your career maintained its original meaning after decades? Or has the way you understood those early pieces changed and evolved as you as a person have changed over time? I think the latter, but I think the integrity in what I was searching um, at the point when I, I, I realized that clay would be the, the metier that I would go in and I would love to, to make. I was very excited when I first learned how to center a piece of clay. And I can remember it very clearly. It was the first time I went outside, it was dark, it was snowing, and I just collapsed in the snow. I was just so excited. So, so I think that excitement is still exists in me. 
And I think I have matured and I hope that I continue to grow. I'm still searching for that perfect, simple piece of ceramics to make. And I need many more years to be able to do that. Well, Magdalene, I just can't thank you enough, um, you know, personally, but on behalf of everyone, all of our students, everyone involved in organizing this project, uh, CSU, the Gregory Alicar Museum and the Scott Artist Series. Um, it's just been such a gift to spend this morning with you and we're really, really looking forward to continuing the conversation tomorrow. I have to say, you know, in this strange time we're living in, I just find it incredibly inspiring and encouraging that we can still come together and have these really um, profound, rich and, and very meaningful conversations. And I feel like all of that is just a, a, a testament to your brilliance and, and generosity. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. Yeah, I couldn't persuade you to come to the Royal College, so that you know, I'm. St <laughs> if for all you students, you're damn lucky you've got Dell because I was trying to, you know, persuade him to apply for a job in England. Well, it's very flattering, England. <laughs> well, I'll find any way I can to spend more time with you. So. Okay, well, Wonderful. I'll see. You, I'll see you tomorrow, and thank you so much for inviting me to to be part of um, your symposium. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you, Magdalene. Thank you everyone for coming. And um, we hope to see you all tomorrow and we'll have some time for open audience questions um, during the panel discussion tomorrow. So we'll look forward to talking with everyone then. Thanks a lot.